welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. Hopefully, uh, once again, but if this is the first time you've tuned in, let me just say I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor of the Pacific Northwest. I've written some books. My last, my latest book is In the House of Tom Bombadil, and I've been a professor of philosophy and done a bunch of other stuff. But enough about me. How about you, Tom? Introduce yourself. Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, Christian thought, uh, moral theology, philosophy. Uh, one of the places is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And currently writing a uh, a book on a uh, sort of primer on Christian ethics in relation to engaging technological matters. <laughs> great, great. All right, Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired history professor specializing in Renaissance and Reformation Europe. I am currently a Ministry Associate at Reflections Ministries and a Senior Fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and I've got a couple of books in the works as well. This week, we have uh, two guests on the show, um, and we're going to be talking about story, what story is, what it does for us, what makes a good story, what doesn't, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so first, uh, Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, so I'm Professor Rachel Fulton-Brown. I teach at the University of Chicago. And I say I've been professor part of it. it. sounds really formal, but I have to use that as like, that's who I am on RFB, right? Um, I teach medieval Christianity, and I also teach a course on Tolkien, which is, I think, why I end up here in a story conversation. <laughs> I've been <laughs> I've been trying my hand at, at some, some fiction writing myself over the last co- couple of years, but in poetry. So I have some sort of Tolkienian thoughts on why you need iambic pentameter, um, and I'm looking forward to explaining why I think we need iambic pentameter for fantasy. Okay, great. And Moira. Oh, (laughs) my name is Moira (laughs) Greyland. I am the daughter of famous disgraced author Marion Zimmer Bradley and the daughter of even more disgraced famous numismatist Walter Breen. I wrote a book called The Last Closet, which outed both of my famous gay parents as gay pedophiles. And since then, uh, well, it's been an interesting run. The book has done very well, uh, but I've ended up speaking out for other children of gays, other former gays, other former trans, and letting the world know that we exist and we have a voice and that anyone who is trapped in being gay or being trans, understand that you're not alone. And if you're the child of gays, you're not alone. All those crazy things that you thought could never possibly be believed by anyone can be believed because we've all go, gone through the same hell. Well, okay. well, it's uh, really great to have you ladies with us. And you're both returning. Uh, we did shows with each of you. And uh, now it's great to have... Uh, you know, the band together again, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> yes. Good, it's so, good to be so, back. <laughs> yeah. And having the band together is a particularly appropriate metaphor for Moira, who is a musician, a singer, and who I have learned has a lot of really interesting ideas about story and narrative and why things work and why they don't. And that was the inspiration for inviting you two on. Um, Rachel Fulton Brown does The Forge of Tolkien uh, and has spent a lot of time, I think, you know, thinking about these kinds of issues. So let's let's just start off with with a, a basic question. Why are stories important? I mean, you know, it's easy for people to make a case for nonfiction. I mean, it deals with real life and all of that kind of thing. But why fiction? And why specifically imaginative fiction, things like fantasy, science fiction, things like that? So I thought that would be a good place to kick it off. So thoughts? I I did this little, like, long series of videos about that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The short answer, I think, is um, these kinds of stories are important because they give shape to our souls. And they are, you, you, you sort of categorize them as, as fiction versus nonfiction. I say, and I do follow Tolkien on, on thinking about it in this term, history is a subset of mythology, not vice versa or the other way around, right? That the stories that we tell about the past are always about making meaning of our lives. And I, I you know, myth, we don't really have a better term for it now than mythology. So we'll, we'll kind of stick with that one. But 
storytelling in fantasy form is the way in which we shape our understanding of reality. And therefore, they are, in fact, more real than what we tend to call nonfiction. And I'm happy to carry on explaining that over the over our discussion. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a fascinating set of distinctions that you've made or, uh, or in a definition. I, I think I get what you're getting at, uh, Rachel, but I think some of the folks that listen uh, will uh, think of uh, history as dealing with, the, with reality and mythology, of course, dealing with, with the imagination, or maybe, maybe, maybe they'll give credit uh, to people in the past and say, well, they really did believe the stuff that they wrote about, you know, that that stuff actually happens. For, so for them, it was like history. But um, I, I don't think that's what you're getting at. I, I suspect you're talking about something a little different. Can you clarify a little bit? Sure. Um, so, what, I mean, we have this fiction that we that history actually exists, right? It doesn't. What we have are traces of the, people's practices in the past, right? Their their buildings, their writing, their stories, their artifacts, and from those traces of p- previous experience and practice, we can we ourselves construct stories, right? And it this is, I mean, in the modern educational context, there's huge fights going on about 1776 versus 1619, and which is the true founding of our country. And and you realize, in fact, both of those are kinds of, of mythologizing, right? That they're telling things about ourselves as a nation, as a country, as a, you know, political entity that you want to highlight. Never in our storytelling can we, like, recreate the whole past and There's another layer there about the media environment that I think we live in and our desire to be immersively present, like time travel. Um, But never, never are we as, as historians giving like direct access to the reality of whatever that created those traces. We're always doing an, uh, you know, interpretive work. So our, our claim that history is, is less fictional doesn't actually match the practice of interpretation that we have to go through in order to make those narratives. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I track with you, but I think that sometimes when people hear what you just said, they immediately uh, assume that you're a postmodernist and you're sort of retreating into their, your consciousness and that kind of thing. But that's not necessarily the case, particularly if you're a realist uh, and you understand that there are realities that are unseen that we're tapping into all the time. You know, you've got another basis. But, you know, I, I, I think that when someone explains what you just explained, Rachel, that's where their mind often goes, at least if they've had, um, you know, a smattering of uh, introduction to, you know, contemporary ways of thinking about these things. Well, that's why, yes, and and you know your own audience, but they're going to panic, right? Because what I just said was <laughs> an attack on their own mythology, right? Yeah, yeah, that, and, yeah, and, yeah. and this, th- this is why I say mythology is actually the thing that we hold most real. And I could say that we have mythologies about history, and and this is where Tolkien really comes into it. He understood this philosophically and practically, right? And in things like the Notion Club papers, he has his characters talking through this problem specifically, right? And and they have they're 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 drawing off Owen Barfield in his poetic diction and and, mm-hmm. and things like that. But they they have this discussion of like what's more real the the Arthurian stories or the, the Normans, right? And, and they realize their barber will have this, this kind of um, fictional version of real history, right? Norman keeps and then Jim, James's oppressing the people and, and stuff like that. And they're all these sort of archetypal characters in our usual understanding of what history means. And, and then you realize that you are, the story that you tell yourself about your reality will if you tell yourself it's history, that's one kind of mythologizing about our access to reality. Now, Chris, you know, I believe absolutely there is a spiritual reality that we need to tie into. And the single most important historical claim that I can make in any moment is this is Anno Domini 2022. <laughs> right? Yep, you're, you're the Lord. <laughs> yep, you're the Lord, right. Right. And and the, the, we care about time in the way that we do as Christians, you know, and you can argue whether or not Dionysius Exiguus got the date right, but that, that we think of time as linear and meaningful and full, that we can fill in all those years, that we have access to that. Our primary historical desire is to be, to know Christ, to know Jesus in his historical incarnation. 
I, I frequently told my students that I don't care what you're talking about. There's more things about the past that we don't know than that we do know, which means we simply have to construct from what we've got. I, you know, we don't know if one of Louis XIV's policies didn't occur because he misunderstood a peasant yelling something to another peasant as his carriage went by. <laughs> and it gave him an idea that he pursued. I mean, we, we don't know if that happened. Um, you know, we, we really, yeah, the, the, the point is the, our understandings of the past are always our best attempt at reconstructing it, but we always reconstruct it from our own perspective. And that, that's always going to color what we're doing. Uh, and, um, yeah, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I was going to add, uh, and I know we want to get to, get to Moira on this as well, so I want to be quick on this. But one of the things I think that, unfortunately, has kind of um, dominated the mindset of a lot of a lot of a lot of us is this kind of strong push that happened. You know, I'd say sixteenth, seventeenth century, late early seventeenth century, towards what you call pure prose. That that language. Um, if it is going to be about reality, has to almost mimic the sciences, right? So it has to be this univocal one-to-one -one kind of correspondence um, with everything kind of read off the surface in, in the most ordinary experienced way. And language just in, 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 in interpretation in life, and it doesn't work that way. And it really took a long time. So this isn't about post-modernity versus modernity. It's, it's about a distortion that I think uh, that really entered into Western thought in particular that, that really made history try to, to, you know, it's where you had the old debates in, you know, um, sort of Wissenschaft and, and the like in Germany, you know, the notion of, of, you know, pure science versus the social sciences or the spiritual sciences in which they were trying to mimic each other. Um, and the language of, of history started to take on these contours that it had to be this kind of, you know, there no analogy, no metaphor, everything had to be, you know, almost uh, as naturalistic or univocal as you could make it. And so uh, I think I think one of the things that gets retrieved with Lewis, with Tolkien, um, and, and different figures is, is this wider plenitude of language for um, making reality uh, in, in its fullness expressed rather than reduced down to one dimension. Anyway, that was a long <laughs> comment. Yeah. yeah, so Moira, your thoughts on this? I don't want to leave you out. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Stories, storytelling, it's a representation of reality where we may not be able to talk about Johnny down the block who's getting beaten up by his father, but we certainly can talk about Sir John who has to defeat a dragon that oppresses him every night. It's easy to come up with fictionalized ways to talk about the things that are real in our lives. And one of the ways that you have, you have, you have an excellent representation of this particular thing in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, where the play is the thing, and the play fictionalizes the actual real life betrayal of Hamlet's father by Laertes and the subsequent betrayal of his mother with his father's brother. And even though nobody said Laertes, even though nobody said this particular king, everybody in the audience knew exactly what was being talked about. And so the great thing about storytelling is that we can talk about real things in a safe way. The reason that modern storytelling has fallen so flat is because storytelling is a representation of reality. And that reality cuts to the heart of whether it's a blue furry monster like the fellow in Monsters, Inc., taking care of a little bitty child of whatever description, we all would see a caring adult in that huge blue furry thing, right? Um, however, the reality has gone away in modern storytelling because it's no longer about person X and person Y. It's about a person X that none of us have ever met, having concerns that make no sense to us, being in relationships that just don't strike us as real, and so it's it's completely boring because stories today tend to be very unreal and a representation of nothing resembling reality. 
instead of stories today resembling reality, they resemble a reality that they wish existed rather than one that actually does exist. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, a good example of that, you know, t- tying it into the concept of mythology here, is we have all kinds of franchises that have created their own mythologies that have suddenly found themselves falling flat. Um, a prime example, I would still say, is Star Wars um, falling flat because something has gone wrong with the stories. Yes. No young okay. man would wants to see himself growing older, not getting the girl, and drinking off some horrible sea mammal. This is not appealing. This is horrible. Yeah, Luke doesn't exactly come off like a great hero by the end of the thing, does he? No, and that was their point. They wanted to get rid of Luke as a hero. They wanted to get rid of the concept of heroism. Okay. Right. So I, t- I absolutely agree. And the, I, what I, the, I, interesting that both Maura and I are saying stories are about reality. This is what I also had in my notes. That they're about truth. And what I would say in the, the kinds of stories that Maura is describing that fall flat, they're just lies. I mean, flat out. Yes. It's not that they're, they're creating, they're, they're trying to create worlds that don't exist. They're trying to create moral world, moral worlds that are a lie. And I'm thank you, thankful, Maury, that you brought up your your book. I have read it and I enjoyed it immensely. As a enjoy is the wrong word. And <laughs> thinking yeah, about what you like you had to go through with your appreciate <laughs> appreciate appreciate it. But I what I enjoyed was was your your amazing ability to see through the the trauma to the truth, and that it is a, a truth telling. That I mean, when you're saying the monsters you know, which monsters we see as truth-telling monsters and which ones we see as groomers, as the word is now, um, are, are, are very important. And that, that, that level of, you know, mythologizing that, you know, true myths are ones that confront the reality of sin and, yes. and, and our fallenness and well, the, yeah. the modern, the, you know, so many of the modern storytellers, they're trying to give, give people out for vice you are aware of the book by F. Scott Peck called People of the Lie? No. Okay, well, don't worry about that, but it boils down, it's much the same sort of thing. People attempting to present a false reality as though it was true. For example, when I was growing up, uh, and I'm not going to assume that anybody has read my book, but when I was growing up, my father, my father the pedophile, he believed he was on a, a sacred quest to help young boys discover who they really were. And of course, who they really were is always gay because he believed that everybody was innately gay. And he feel he felt that he was freeing people, which is, of course, insane. And a normal story would present him as a monster. Of course it would. And it would present his lies as villainous. And even if he truly believed the lies, and even if we could accept the truth, which is that he didn't see himself as a villain, but objectively he really was and to conquer him, to put him in prison, to stop him from doing what he was doing, was essential, no matter how much we all loved him, and we did, and we do. I quoted Princess Buttercup when asked how I felt about putting my father in prison. My comment was, I died that day. It was the most horrible thing I've ever done in my life. Not because I think it was wrong. It wasn't wrong. It was right. But it hurt like hell because I knew he was going to die there, and nothing, nothing could save him. Nothing could save him because he was going to go to the judge and tell the judge, oh, well, I wrote this book and it's all about how children need sex and, and I'm trying to help them find out who they really are and just all this garbage. And yet right. now stories like America Chavez, okay, she's a hero. Why is she a hero? Well, she is. Well, has she done anything heroic? No. Is she overcoming any adversity? No. Is she saving anyone? No, but she's a hero. <laughs> and we're supposed to accept that just because they say she's a hero. Poof, she's a hero. And it's just stupid. And of course we don't accept it. So the movies bomb. Of course they do. Right. And there's two there's two layers of, of storytelling. It's like, Maury, you've written your own history. And what, you know, one thing that we as historians ought to be doing is showing the, the sins and the failures and the lies 
uh, previous versions of the story and of people's behaviors and so forth, which is is very, very difficult. I mean, it's hard enough understanding the truth of our own lives, considering the truth of our nation's history or of our you know whole civilization or our culture or of humanity. I mean, that it, we going back to what I was saying at the beginning about, you know, how much we have access to the one thing we definitely have access to. And I do believe this you know, fundamentally as a Christian is we understand what sin is. And most of the time, if, if you're reading a story where like, I don't know, Louis the 14th or something, you're trying to see someone's um, evil as, oh, well, but that was instrumentally useful or that was, you know, excusable at the time. We know, we know these are lies. Right. And I do think, some of what's going on in the in the retelling of our national history is acknowledging things that we probably should have talked about but weren't said because we wanted to preserve this other vision of of who we are. But one way or the other, we're going to end up having to recognize that somebody was was not telling the truth. Yeah, I think one of the things I hear in both of you uh, is the uh, uh, kind of unstated uh, truth that there is a human nature, and because there is a human nature. Um, there is a way for us to sort of enter into the past uh, and try to understand it because the people in the past are like us. Yes. We study history. I think, you know, we study history because we want to enter into other people's stories and choices. And, and the the other thing that I had, I I appreciated Moria was talking about this. We, We need, we need real challenges and test of character. And those things are the things that make good stories because you know that people were up against something difficult. It's easy to choose sin. It's much easier to go along with, you know, the the prizes and the social accolades and the temptations and and so forth. And it's very, very difficult in Tolkien terms to refuse the ring. So, you know, good, a good story needs truth and it needs the truth of those kinds of trials, I think. And, and the real choices and courage that it takes to make those right choices. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm supposed to admit this as a historian, but I really decided I wanted to study history because I liked stories. <laughs> you know, and that's that's not the kind of thing a historian should admit, but I'm retired, so I can do that. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a lie brought about by the mid 20th century social <laughs> scientific turn. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and the and the and the failure to acknowledge. I mean, I'm just going to harp on this, you know, virtue and vice and 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 sin and redemption and the, the social scientific, you know, uh structure as as it were to excuse excuse all of those sorts of choices that people make it, it's it's amazing right and i think the, the 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 obverse in storytelling is you can never have a villain because oh they're always you know a victim of their own their their circumstances right it's it's the it's the kind of thing moyer's mentioning with if your father could make some argument well this is just who i am right that comes out of all of this psychology and social science and political science and so forth which are all basically making excuses for the the structure that people either find themselves trapped in or think is necessary to correct everybody else. We know what that structure is. It's Christ, but people don't like talking about that. Speaking Hmm. of which, you want to look to the actual model for the best storytelling is naturally the Bible. Because with the Bible, not only do you have the overall arc of redemption from Adam to us and beyond, but all of these stories about people who did the most dastardly things and some of whom could not be redeemed and died ignominiously and others who were redeemed, Saul of Tarsus, murdered people and then became a mighty, mighty saint of God. And so we have in the Bible everything we need to know about storytelling because the one thing that our Lord never did was pull punches. And what you were saying, (laughs) one thing I noticed when they first brought out the new version of the Grinch who stole Christmas and all of a sudden this evil, evil being is he's just, he's just a poor victim of bullying. And they did the same <laughs> thing with the new version of Willy Wonka. Uh, oh, he's a poor bullied fellow. But the thing is a lot of us were bullied and we didn't end up that way. And That's it right. would never occur to us to end up that way. We can get mad sometimes, but being mad sometimes is not the same as becoming evil. And yeah. The thing is, to me, the Grinch, the new Grinch, and the new Willy Wonka were the first really big examples in the culture of evil being fluffed up and and excused instead of understood as being evil. It it became a natural product of being a victim. 
It's just silly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, you, you can multiply the examples. I mean, there's, I forgot what it was called, but there was one that worked on redeeming the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wizard of Oz. That too. Um, you know, we've got the Wicked Queen in Snow Wrong. White who's being redeemed or, or or explained psychologically as really not being that bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that yeah. that's a growing trend. It's, it is yeah. stupid, but the, the good thing about it is that audiences don't buy it. Audiences hate those movies. Right. And they wanted to rehabilitate all of their villains. But the thing is, it isn't flying. And I know that Jung and his integrating the shadow and all that stuff would have us believe all of that stuff. But part of part of the thing about storytelling is that it is the common language of humanity. And you can't just introduce a whole bunch of, if you'll excuse me, feces into the food supply and expect us to not notice. We all know what truth is. We all know what reality is, and we all know when we're being fed a line of garbage. What, what's interesting about that is how much of the Bible is story. Uh, I've got a friend who's a, well, he's German and he's an engineer. And that, that's, uh, that's sort of a double whammy on him. But he would really like a list of things that he has to believe and a list of things that he has to do, a checklist. <laughs> but that's not how the Bible came to us because stories translate across culture. And there are a lot of other reasons as well, but that, that's one of them. There are a lot of cultures that that checklist wouldn't work for. It might work for a German engineer, but it doesn't work in almost any other context. The stories speak in a way that those kinds of engineering specs don't. Well, that's because he doesn't understand the place that those specs are coming from in his own practice. Right. To him, it's like having nothing but the morals and no parable. And he wants just a list of the morals. And that, I mean, Jesus told parables because we understand the complexities of our behavior better if we have to reason them out or, you know, play them out psychologically in these stories. And also that parable um, and, you know, say fairy story is like parable is like miracle story. It's it, they're mysteries. And, and I think interesting, one of the things that we don't learn properly unless we have to work it out ourselves, right? So mm -hmm. you have to kind of puzzle it through and recognize yourself in the story to get the lesson out of it. Otherwise, it's, yeah, it's just a list of things. And, you, you know, the, the aha moment is, ah, I get it now. That's what this story means. And then you read it again, and it means something different because there's layers. But that there's that aha. If you don't ever have that aha moment, one, I think, obviously, people just experience instructions to virtue as imposed rules that they don't want to follow. Well, then tell them a story about what happens if you don't follow the rules, then they'll get it. <laughs> right. So I, it's, it's a, uh, we, we learn by language. We learn, you know, Christ had to become incarnate to give us the story of his life so that we then can see it because we weren't, people just weren't getting it without that. They were <laughs> prophets came and said, don't do this. And they kept, you know, misbehaving and disobeying. So God says, well, okay, I'll make this story. I'll show you what the story is supposed to, you, you're supposed to be living. And uh, yeah, your, your engineer friend is wrong. He thinks that you can get it just with the list of the, the, the conclusions, right? But you're not going to get that conclusion unless you've seen the working of the proof. Right. And it's why the, the whole business about representation is such nonsense. Because in a story, again, like Monsters, Inc., I look at that story and I really identify with the blue guy who's taking care of the child. And as far as I know, I'm not blue. <laughs> I'm definitely not. <laughs> at all. I also identified with the child, even though I'm not that tiny and haven't been for a long time. And I even identified a bit with the white cracking green guy. And I think I have more than one eye. So we don't have to look like the person for that matter, the Bible. We've all identified with Christ. And we also have identified with his mother and we've identified with a prodigal son, and we've identified with all these people who don't look anything like us, right? We've, we've identified with people that we don't have any idea what they look like, and we also don't care what they look like. We identify with who they are, what they're feeling, what they're doing, whether they're eight foot tall blue aliens or just people, because we are all people. Well, it, it's right. interesting right. because it's the way in which story becomes a vehicle of of created kinds and human agency, um, and and that is the best way. I mean, in order to be a human or to be a creature, you enact yourself in time. I mean, that's what it's what we are. 
right? That dis- that's what's distinct about us and, and God. So God isn't, you know, one more character within the story, even though the story with us and God is is a real story. Um, God transcends that, yet yet uh, he's 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 not one more being determined by that time, and yet. There is, because of that relation that we have to God, s- such a thing that makes it the case that we our, our human agency and our language and our embodiment um, allow for stories to almost become a vehicle of, you know, like I think Glenn was mentioning a minute ago, a universal grammar, that when you read the stories of any tribe, people, or nation— there is something, as you, you just said, Moira, in which you can identify with the prodigal, with this, with this, because there is something that does lift out of the particularities and determinations of a human in one situation, but still speaks to that creation, uh, that share, sharing in creation that we all have. Um, so it is a profound vehicle that, even though it can be particular, local, and limited, has the capacity to speak across the whole board of, of human humankind. And I think, of course, the, the Bible is the, uh, you know, the case in point, you know, to tr- every tribe and nation, somehow their stories in this story coalesce um, mm-hmm. and, and find their, their uh, fulfillment and, and, uh, and meaning. Yeah, Chris, you were going to say something. Yeah. I just wanted to reflect. I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts uh, or reflections on uh, the, it's kind of the state of the the art, so to speak, today when it comes to storytelling. The gatekeepers, uh, we've reflected on the fact that they want to kind of invert everything, kind of reinvent stories to kind of like reflect their own political uh, sort of interests or agenda. And, you know, if you try to get a story picked up by not just a publishing house or a, a movie theater or uh, studio, but even an agent these days, it's almost like you have to uh, kind of violate all the rules we're talking about here when it comes to a good story for them to even take an interest in what you're talking about. In other words, they, they, they're screening out good stories. It's not just that people don't write good stories. There may be a lot of good storytellers out there who just don't, can't get anybody to you know, sort of publish their work. <laughs> and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, they're screening out good storytellers i just said they want sin right <laughs> they want they want excuse they're all they're all marquis de sade right they want to it you know philosophize and then and then make people into robots that they have sex with um th- no i i, I think that's it's like and we're, we're looking for good stories i'm i'm not you know of the absolutely every story participates in the same thing i mean we ha- we need to be able to say you know these stories point us to virtue and these p- stories excuse our our failing right they excuse our our sinfulness and and most of the stories in the you know modern popular media are excuses um for people's lust i mean a lot of that right and um you know i think the if, if you're just wanting for the the past it's like look at whether or not they're either challenging people to confront their own failures and, and, and sin, or whether they're just excusing them. The, the, I had another thought about, it's like, why is pop culture failing? Um, one, there's the very famous concept of the Mary Sue, which I think is one of the things that killed off the, the Star Wars thing, right? Excuse me. <coughs> I'm, being, I'm being attacked. <laughs> Always um, happens during this right, show. Right, right, right. When I said that, right, the Mary Sue, it's like you know what I'm about to say, and we're going to find out that that it's a it's a female character who's basically wins every bout, every fight she's ever in. Right? There's no, there's nothing defeats her. I mean, the one I I stopped watching the, the Star Wars after I think it's Ray. I don't know. It's like it was so pointless. It's like she she grows up with the Force. She finds the sword. She can fight with a sword instantaneously. Having spent some decades learning defense, I know that's a lie, right? And, <laughs> and giving 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 women this sort of oh well, you know, you just have to be you, girl. You go, girl, and you're you're going to always be no one. That and Moria mentioned this. You don't want men. Don't want to see themselves not being heroes. Men need actual tests of strength and and courage and and choices, right? And women, 
you know, PC alert, right? Or whatever we say now, SGW alert. Women need to be learn to be patient. And and right. and we and are as women, <laughs> we're always wanting to fix everything now, right? And and I think that the Mary Sue is like a sort of perfect fix thing already before she's even a character. That that there's she there's can't be embarrassed, she can't be mm. challenged, she can't be any of these things. She's just perfect already. Whereas w- w- women's, you know, our 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 default. And that's why Mary is such an important model for women. She has to be patient through some really hard stuff, basically watching her son die, right? And 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 being trust trusting that, you know, when he dies, it's not the end because in in Catholic understanding, she has actually some knowledge that it, it isn't, but she still has to be that, live through it, right? That's an enormous challenge for women. We're always wanting to get in there and either, you know, pick up the crying child and make everything better instantly or just not be not have anything difficult happen. And I think you can see that in the, the women superhero characters that they're putting in those movies, that they're, they're flawless, but they're boring. Yeah. You know, my favorite example, or maybe my least favorite example is uh, Captain Marvel. Um, Now, aside from the fact that (laughs) the movie was incredibly obnoxious and destroyed, like all of the other characters in it. um, Do you realize that, in um, Endgame, if she had arrived 10 minutes sooner, the whole thing would have been unnecessary because <laughs> she single-handedly destroyed uh, Thanos' ship. And if she had gotten there a little bit earlier, none of none of the stuff would have happened. She was putting her makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, but this is this is to my point i mean it's it's moms wanting to go in and fix everything and make it perfect instantaneously and it's not it's not letting the children have any adventures or challenges um but it's also you know smotheringly and coercive smothering and coercive yes yeah you, you right. brought out something that there rachel that I, that I had never considered and i and i think you're absolutely right because uh, so many storytellers today in this PC environment want to project the sort of competent, strong woman figure, they can't sort of leave any room for her to develop into a strong, competent character. In other words, she can't she can't begin she can't even begin as weak. She has to be kind of competent from the start. Because if we admit any room for improvement, we're like being. Uh, misogynist or something. And that shows up again with Captain Marvel, where when you watch the the origin movie, she's having trouble climbing the ropes and things like that when she's in Air Force training and all the men are mocking her. Good. Reality's good. Um, you know, so, so where, she, where she has room to grow, it's done in a feminist context in which the men are the, the, these evil bad guys who are, are trying to hold her back. That, that's, the, that's the message of, of the movie. That's annoying as heck. Right. And for men, this is, this is a real problem because men need to be mocked. <laughs> you know you need to haze each other you need to test you need to to test each other and your loyalty and your courage and things like that and and the i mean that I, I say this as a sport fencer right you know i've, I've been through a lot of a lot of yeah. training in, in the in the, the the sort of physical emotional kind that's where my blog came from right and the that one of the things i've always you know that's been clear to me in fencing all along is women and men think about the whole problem differently right women mm-hmm. in the in the in the in the sport you know we're all about making sure we're all female included but we're going to beat each other right so it, it gives us this kind of schizophrenia <laughs> the, the men they're completely comfortable with being in rivalries with each other and then they go have a beer together, right? So, yeah. Yeah. We just I, I, we take the challenges of social of social competition differently. And if we're if our stories aren't true to those aspects of what we are as women and men, nobody's gonna believe them, right? Women are catty and mean. Sorry, we are. That's true. That's right. True. And, 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 and and if you if you portray right. us, just go ahead. That was one place G.I. Jane got it right, that she dumped, she was dumped in the middle of this bunch of guys and she was, she was a bitch, but she, she was in the middle of a bunch of guys who hazed her and told her the truth and acted like guys, which was very refreshing. And she got to fall on her backside repeatedly. And I, I do agree with the guy who said, you know, don't put women in combat. Men will die to protect them because that's true. 
But still, I do appreciate that they allowed her to fall on her face. I do appreciate they allowed her to fail. And I do appreciate that they allowed her to be hazed and that they allowed mm-hmm. the men to be men instead of making them all, you know, psychophantic, adoring. Oh, she's so amazing, which is what they probably do today. Yeah. You know, uh, there was a meme that I saw that that uh, said the difference between men and women. Uh, one woman asks another, you know, do I look fat? And the other woman says, oh, no, you look fine. You look great. This is fabulous and all that. <laughs> man asks another man, do I look fat? The response is, dude, you've got your own gravity field. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's and that that encapsulates it i think that you know, that's the way guys behave with other guys that's true. That's true. and for heaven's sakes allowing men to be men and allowing women to be women it's it's essential for storytelling now i had a i had a thought sort of related to this and that is my concept of overall storytelling and the reason that the hero's journey has always been popular and always will be popular is because it is essentially the story of forming a family. And by the end of the story, the guy gets the girl and they go off and live happily ever after. We've left the world in good hands. The next generation is fine. Whereas Mm -hmm. variations on that, the next generation is toast. There is no next generation if the guy doesn't get the girl. There is no generation if she goes off to be self-actualized and can't be bothered to have a family. And these days, the one thing that these heroic women never seem to manage to do is get married or have kids. And, you know, only roughly about, you know, 94, 95% of the female human race would like to do that with men. We, why assume that we don't want what we want? And why try to train us to not want what we want? We know what reality is and we know what we want and we know what we do and we know what we have done. We're not going to suddenly start wanting to go be Amazon women and fight men with swords just because they tell us that that's what women are supposed to be. That's just silly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting, just a totally different genre, but La La Land, um, one one of the most recent um, movie musicals, probably the most recent from a few years back, it completely subverts the entire story of, of movie musicals because at the end they don't get together. They each pursue their own career. No wonder I haven't heard of it. Yeah, who, <laughs> who cares, right? Well, and the same, thing. same thing. She wants to be a tailor. Why? Yeah, yeah. By the way, Moira, in, in connection with that, um, Doug Wilson, who's a fairly controversial guy in the Reformed world, but has got a lot of really good things to say. He summarizes the story of the Bible as "kill the dragon, get the girl." I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's it's right. It's true. Yes. The, mean that the means, church is the bride of Christ. God says, don't do the thing. God, we did the thing. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I well, like your it, it is a, a di- different thing while it's on my mind is, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of detective stories. I, I always have been. I remember pacifist uh, Stanley Hauerwas writing this uh, great article on why he loves murder mysteries. <laughs> um, and he was getting into kind of Father Brown and those kind of things. But one of the things you start to see similar to the kind of uh, politicizing of stories and trying to make them political correct in the, the kind of detective movie uh, uh, or, you know, series is now it is all about, you know, what they've changed it to is basically you always have a sort, a sort an issue with, you know, immigration or terrorism or so. It starts to change from solving a mystery and fighting good and evil to now having to adjust your civilizational worldview to make acceptance for the other, you know. And, and you're starting to see every sort of genre kind of be, be pushed away from what, I mean, I, I always see, I think, you know, there is a continual fascination with detective stories, even in a very, you know, postmodern, politically correct world, um, where there is still someone who they don't fundamentally know why, but they're still trying to fight evil and bring justice, you know? Um, and, and even in their, their home lives are messed up as a detective and everything else. Nevertheless, they're committed to solving this crime and fighting this evil and injustice. And this kind of perverts the whole, the whole kind of mystery story because now it becomes an issue of it's really the detective who needs to start to make space for difference and other conceptions of, you know, um, 
you know, injustice and, and the like. So you, you are really seeing this enter almost every genre of film and, and I think, story, and, and it is kind of depressing. <laughs> P.D. James talked about this. Um, she said in Britain they call that detective fiction. She said that she really likes the American terminology of the mystery mm. because that's at the heart of what you're doing. And she says it, they always have to be about murder because there is nothing else that is so important. There is nothing else that is such a, a, an evil to fight. So they always have to be about murder, and there's always a mystery involved. You know, now, what's interesting is that was P.D. James' rule. P.D. James was a Christian. And... I think you're right that although m murders tend to be part of what's going on now, the murder is usually placed in some sort of larger context, um, whether it's you know immigration or the war on drugs or fill in the blank, so that the murder is more understandable and you can kind yeah. of sympathize with it and, and so on. Yeah. It's more like they want to start with a political precept and hang the story around its neck right. yes, rather exactly. than telling a story and just throwing the politics out the window. Just tell a story. And it ruins the whole interest, for me, the whole interest in the story. I already know when you read in the thing, oh, this is about you know, this particular issue that I don't want to watch it. I don't want to listen to it. It's not yeah. just because I'm, yeah. you know, narrow-minded and don't want to have certain experience. I know where it's going, and it's flat and boring because it isn't about dealing with real issues of good and evil and all of the complexities and layers to that versus, like you said, trying to um, justify certain kinds of actions because of certain kinds of uh, injustices. Right. Right. It's interesting that it's flat and boring because it is, in fact, evil. Evil mm. is flat and boring. Yes. <laughs> it, it because it's sterile. And, yeah, that's, and right. that's what what Maura is saying about the, um, you know, we only the only life we have is children. Right. And the all of Tolkien stories, you know, they end in marriages. Right. Comedy ends in a marriage. And I love I love the reminder that, yes, the, the one great story in the Bible is God gets his bride right it, it's it's the it's the night saving 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 humanity and marrying her in in revelation um that we it, it, no other story is is going to be a comedy right that is the great christian comedy is the marriage mm -hmm. of That's the lamb <laughs> in, it, you know to the marriage of the lamb to the heavenly city and i so if I may indulge my 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 poet teams. So one of the other things that we've learned, um, we've written three poems now, or we've written two poems and published those, and and we are um, writing the third one right now. Um, the first one was a satire modeled on Alexander Pope's Dunciad, and we put sent the characters on a quest, and it's about it's 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 the evils of abortion. We can talk about that if you want. Um, the second story we wrote for children because we were depressed about the first one. Um, that <laughs> we sent. Um, some bears from the North Pole on a quest for a, a heavenly gem, the Aurora Australis, right? The, the light of, of, of the, the Southern, they go from the North to the South and they so, meet, yeah. uh, they, they meet some penguins in a, in a city and they end up having to solve some riddles and rescue the panda again and so forth. And there, and there's boy versus girl characters because the, the, the bears have to rescue the panda from the mean seals and so forth. <laughs> I mean, that, that when we, we started learning that the more we were writing ourselves into these stories, the more they became models for the kinds of encounters that we were having in real life. Right. It's like, how do we deal with this kind of, Manipulation. How do we deal with this kind of pressure and and so forth? The story that we're writing now is called Draco Alchemicus, which is the alchemical dragon, which has various layers in it. But the the, the primary like plot structure is in fact Christ's entry into the world and his quest for his his bride. But how we do that and how we pull it off it's it's a it's a horror it's a horror story with dragons and electricity and 
um, a magical pigeon cloud and <laughs> a variety of things. <laughs> but but and and that Elon Musk has bought Twitter this week has really blown our story because he's like got the birds with you know. The, <laughs> what one of the interesting things that happens we found in the writing of these fantasies is they start tapping reality so that we feel like we're creating it, right? It's like, what? He just bought Twitter. We just had our man, you know, become incarnate through the pigeon cloud. What? <laughs> <laughs> and and <laughs> this we do not have a way to account for, but, you know, what we tell ourselves and we're hoping is we're actually tapping into the one story, right? There is one big story that we're living in. And Tolkien, I think, felt like he was doing that too. He always, he always talks about that as the sort of moment in – the Lord of the Rings, when Sam realizes they're in the same story as the Silmarillion, right? That that we as Christians recognizing ourselves in that one great comedy is the drive, the, the sort of glorious drive for our our lives, but also the the you know sort of the mystery that we are in fact trying to solve, uh, understand is how how do how do we end up in that heavenly wedding? Yeah. Now the problem with this is that. I have seen way too many really bad Christian movies <laughs> that are just thinly disguised tracts, you know, Give laying tracks, out, you know. <laughs> typically, typically, typically we have the answer there. to that, too. <laughs> being fair, typically done by evangelicals. Okay, let's be real here. But, um, yeah, I mean, so, so there needs to be an element of art in this as well. Right. Not just didacticism, if that's a word. Well, and that's where our iambic pentameter comes in. But it, it's also going back to um, what we were saying about how in the modern period, the early modern period, we end up with everything flat, that history just becomes this 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 sort of prosodic. Yeah. Um, uh, we lose the figural. We lose the the allegorical yeah. and the relational. And the I mean, that what we feel ourselves in the reality of the story is the rep, the heavenly reference. Right. And and the the parabolic reference so the, the the spiritual reference. My sense is, and I, I know almost no modern Christian literature except Tolkien, but <laughs> I, I hear often that it's not fun, um, <laughs> is that it's it's lost it's lost that layering, right? It's lost that layering of of history, allegory, morality, and anagogy that medieval storytelling participates in, and that modern fantasy, aka Lewis and Tolkien, were obviously deeply schooled in and could could draw on, right? It's like when when Sam sees a rendal in the sky and recognizes it as the same light that Frodo's carrying in the, in the star glass, you've got that sort of cascading of references and layers, which modern storytellers, I don't, you know, it's not very rich because they don't have, from my perspective, the fullness of the, the sort of what it takes to, you know, have God enter into his creation from heaven to earth and all of those associations and references. Yeah, and I think that that's also one of the things that I, I find particularly interesting in his essay on fairy stories, that, you know, the the point is that one of the things that the fairy story does is it takes things from the mundane world and infuses them with greater significance. So bread and wine that appear in a fairy story suddenly makes the bread and wine that you have in your home have additional meaning and additional import. It actually, it actually doesn't give it more meaning. It reveals the meaning that's already there. And then, of course, that connects in with the Eucharist. Right. So that, that I see that great Christian storytelling should be revelatory and mm -hmm. in that way, right, you're seeing the significance of the the, the mundane in, in 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 the story, and that I I think maybe modern Christian movies, the the few that I I think I've worried about, I, I watch a lot of Mel Gibson, and he's actually good at, it, but he's Catholic. Um, that that <laughs> well, a lot of us. if if if. If, if they're mainly ex, ex, if they're mainly exercises in in, in believing miracle, they're not going to work, right? And and that that is maybe the, the the key here. You know, it's like if it's a movie about oh, it's a miracle and it actually happened, that's a scientific problem, right? That's a yeah. can we prove the truth of miracle, which is different from can we find significance? Yeah, sign, the sign character of miracle. It's the, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's very. It is. It is very. That that is classic Christianity. It was the sign character, a miracle, not the surprise of it. For for God to to do a miracle was right. no big surprise. What what it entailed 
you know, what could this mean is the, is the, you know, the, the Jews would say whenever they saw these things happen with Christ, right? What could this mean? <laughs> that was their reaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Maura. I want to tell you about why I have hope for the future of movies. The reason that I have hope for the future of movies is because as I probably haven't mentioned very recently, uh, I'm an opera singer, you know that, I play the harp, all that stuff. But what that means is that in the course of my getting a master's in music, I was subjected to hundreds of recitals of atonal music. See, back in the <laughs> Renaissance, we had wonderful, wonderful plinkety plinkety stuff, and then we had uh, more elaborate plinkety plinkety stuff, just amazing, incredible centuries of glorious music. Uh, going through its various phases. And then we get to the romantics, which is all sweeping emotions. And then we get to the moderns, and the moderns take that sweeping emotionalism and completely throw out the rule book, which means you get atonality. And the problem mm -hmm. with atonality is it's completely not memorable. There are no melodies. And yeah. the reason I mentioned getting subjected to hundreds of hours of recitals of this twaddle is because it's almost as though they thought that forcing all of us students to listen to atonal music would cause us to appreciate it. And instead, yeah. because because I am who I am, we were all asked to write reports, reports on these atonal music concerts, and I was very, very accurate. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's the, it's, the it's, it's, it's it's that. After 20, 30 yeah. years of trying to force us to love atonal music, yeah. now we have Howard Shore. Now we have Ennio Morricone. Yeah. Now we have the resurgence of, for anybody who doesn't know who Howard Shore is, he did the music for The Lord of the Rings. And it yeah. is glorious. From the perspective of a musician who lives in this stuff, I listen to Howard Shore's music and I'm dripping with tears. It is that gloriously yeah. beautiful. And so if we can come through the modernists and their endless attempts to jam the likes of Alban Berg and Late Schoenberg and George Crum and all these just sure, yeah. atrocious charlatans and their lost noises down our throats, now that has finally petered out. Nobody is attempting to put star charts on, on, on scores and claim it's heavenly music anymore. It's simply getting on the keys. Nobody's yeah, doing that now. Now yeah, a resurgence of truth and beauty. Yeah, with uh, Schoenberg, interesting. I I did my first degree was in music, and I and I actually was at uh, one of the composers at the university I was at uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Performing Arts was Deacon Newland, who was the protege student of Schoenberg and the Twelve Tone Row. And uh, first of oh, all, she was a, a she was a disturbed character, but she ended up in her eighties and nineties in a punk rock band and making weird uh, <laughs> photographs of, the, of of acting like she was the Virgin Mary with her cat at Christmas. Very weird. She ended up very disturbed. But you know, do you know that uh, Schoenberg used to try to control her dating life? She was his his chief compositional student, but he would he was so controlling with his 12 tones, right? That he control, he was so controlling of her. He really left the, you, you talk about, you talk about uh, aesthetic abuse, Schoenberg and Deacon Newland, <laughs> completely. <laughs> if, if you could use, if I could coin a term today, aesthetic abuse, <laughs> that was yeah. it. <laughs> we'll add about Schoenberg that before he got tone wrote, uh, and I wrote a lot of really impertinent poems to my theory teacher who was teaching us about the 12 tones, I wrote the rudest poetry imaginable about that stuff. But anyway, <laughs> uh, early Schoenberg, when he wrote Gurleader, which is one of his earlier works, oh my yeah. goodness gracious, what a glorious, glorious piece of music that was. It was yeah. somewhat atonal, yes, there, but there was also just so much melody and so much yeah. beautiful sweet music. It's another sort of thing. You could listen to that and have the tears running down your face. But anything yeah. after Gurleader... It, it seems like he got a he got a, a bad case of twelve tone flu, and then it all just became horrible. <laughs> and you're right, insisting you use every single one of the notes of the scale, all twelve of them, before you repeat one. Ew! It sounds it's terrible. horrible. It's terrible. So you're saying aesthetic abuse? It's abusive not only for the composer, if you could call a composer that, but for the audience as well. Yeah. You know, th one of the things that I found interesting is that when Howard Shore wrote the music for The Lord of the Rings, the theme for The Hobbits and The Shire 
is this is my father's world. <laughs> right. You're right. It is. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, what, you, there, there was a connection that's been made here that I think is maybe worth thinking a little bit about, and that's uh, when you lose faith in the goodness of sort of the structures of reality, you become a control freak because you, you want to impose uh, mm-hmm. yeah. order on chaos or create yeah. an order out of nothing. And isn't that what every villain tries to do? Yeah. And isn't that yes. what CRT in critical <laughs> theory generally does? When they elect themselves yeah. God. Yeah. And right isn't now. it interesting how Star Wars only really disintegrated when no mention of God was ever allowed on set again? Hmm. As soon as God was evicted the rest of the way, all of a sudden Star Wars is nothing but a giant circle jerk in costumes. Hmm. Forgiving. Mm-hmm. She said it. <laughs> she said it. We did. Top <laughs> Well, I've watched the first four episodes of Discovery once. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> it was so, torture. They're horrible. Yeah. It is bad. Yeah. Top- topically, I'm doing a I'm doing a course this quarter on the quadrivium. Have, have, oh. Having done the quadrivium, where I have to learn, you know, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, I'm like, oh, I need to learn the number stuff, which is hard to talk about because it's about numbers, not words, right? So you can't talk yeah. about it. Um, <laughs> Um, but our our lesson today was on Guido Varezzo and his development of the the modern stave system. Uh, you know, uh, and one of the things we yes, had to understand, yes, I, that I had a a stu- student who actually was trained in Gregorian chant growing up, so he was able to explain this to us a little bit better. Um, but but where the tones come from, and where you know how you use a monochord to actually understand the relationship between you know the notes of an octave and the and the the uh, diapente and the diatessaron and stuff like that. By the end of it, one, it was glorious because not a tetrachord, what, a monochord, not a tetrachord, a monochord, a monochord, just the single, single string. Right. And then, um, we were talking about the way in which, uh, it, it, it resonates all of the different frequencies in nature. Yes, right. Yes, so the, all the all half and the quarter and the, all of them, yes. Yeah, so you probably feel this constantly. It's like every time you pluck one of those strings, it's resonating with the others. And um, that when Guido's describing this, he says this is science harmon, you know, with nature, right? It's like the sounds work because they're the sounds in nature that would exist in nature with or without human beings. It's reality. It's reality, right. exactly. It's actually reality. And so the modern music, when Maury is describing it, is saying, yeah, it's it's trying to wreck reality. It's not harm. It's not harmonizing with the actual um, frequencies of, of creation, and it's just that, forgotten. Yeah, like that, that's, I think that is fundamental. That's fundamental, and I think this is this is something that figures like I think Bach, even though they weren't aware of it on a kind of mathematical level, they were on an aesthetic spiritual level. That they're you know especially with adding this particular voice in the in the way in which a counter melodies worked not in in conflict but harmoniously was was richly theological but that's why the aesthetic mm-hmm. does what it does for us um bec- and there is you know and it, this is one of the things i love about the silmarillion right the way in which creation story um mm-hmm. is communicated musically and of course you know maybe that's the shaping uh, of of my own life but to me that that just is so it's so rich the way it captures I think those aesthetic dimensions that are about that that are in, intrinsic and inherent in the created order as it as it celebrates and manifests it, as it you know as as it you know as it voices creation's praise as some have said I mean I think that's the way you know to work with it the way in which creation is sung into existence and the way in which sound has a way of so or- organizing itself that beauty that can actually transcend any kind of evil um, is able to, to penetrate humanity. It, it's stunning. Again, I don't think theologians have ever dealt with the way they should music. Um, they do in understanding its importance for liturgy and worship, but not in terms of reflection. I think we're, we're way behind on that issue. <laughs> You're reminding me of the works of Madeline Lingle. Yeah. And the way that she described the music, and the way that the way that creation yeah. was happening, and yeah. and and the angels, and the <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the <laughs> 
Yeah, we ought, we ought to have you. We ought to have you folks back sometime for maybe a discussion of Madeleine Glight. We haven't had a chance to talk about her work on the podcast yet, and it'd be great to get into the time quartet and all of that. We should probably wrap things up. I don't know if there's anything that anybody wanted to say though before we do, because we're getting about to that time when when we do wrap things up. <laughs> yeah, just one quick comment. Um, I find it interesting that we worked our way into music. And yet our final conclusions about music brings us right back to story. It's about <laughs> truth. It's about resonance with nature. Reality. It's about it, it's about reality. Yes. Right, right. Yes, and that's why poetry matters, because poetry is is word music, right? And, yeah. and, and it, one of the texts we read for the Quadrivium course is Augustine's on music. And it's, it's a frustrating text to read because you think, when is he going to talk about music? It's nothing but meter. <laughs> and and the, the 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 medieval understanding of music included poetic meter and if you say the liturgical music that we have the the church chant is in fact this i mean singing with the angels it's it's where i think tolkien is getting with the anilindale hmm. it's like the angels sing at creation hmm. yeah yeah that's great there's a reason why music is mathematical it's yes. in the yeah. mathematical arts. You know, it, right. it's all about proportion. It's about rhythm. It's about fractions. It's about all of those kinds of things. Yes. Yeah, it's the connections that Pythagoras made. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot uh, for joining us today. And it's been a really fun conversation. We need to have you back again, uh, maybe for, you know, carrying forward this, uh, this, uh, this theme that we've just been talking about just now about the connection between music and reality and, even Madeline Langle. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank, thanks for joining us. And we do appreciate uh, all the folks out there in podcast land who listen to us each week. I mean, we're told that our audience on a weekly basis is between five and 10,000 people. We've got about, you know, people from 40 different countries who listen to us and just astonishes us. Uh, we appreciate the ongoing financial support that people give to the show. We, we do use those funds to pay for the costs that and that nothing goes into the pockets of anyone who's on the show. It just goes into uh, making sure that we can get the show out each week. And so we, we appreciate those gifts. And uh, if you want to give us a, a, a you know a five star rating, uh, that would be appreciated on whatever platform that you listen to us on. If you don't like us, how come you've listened this long? <laughs> anyway, so bye bye. Bye now, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.